times over the years that I have read this particular passage of scripture, I never once thought it would apply directly to our lives until this week. <clears throat> First, we need to have a little bit of historical context. Remember that the Gospels were not written while Jesus was alive. They came later, when people needed to make sure that the information wasn't lost, and when they needed to be able to share that information with others who were at a great distance. <clears throat> the best guess for the time of writing for the Gospel of Luke is 80 to 100 AD, and possibly it continued to be revised into the second century. Actually, our reading for today is one of the clues for the dating of the text. The temple fell and was destroyed by Rome in AD 70. Luke offers some comfort to the people living post-temple by sharing a prediction from Jesus that this would happen, with a promise that they would be given words when the time comes to need them. It must have been terribly frightening to live not just under Roman rule, but without the temple, their center for their culture. They must have felt like they were lost at sea. The temple was foundational to knowing themselves as a people. Well, I've said that this week the passage directly relates to us. Not that we've been overtaken by an evil power and both our identity and our security are lost, but many feel as though that has happened. And many of our own citizens are acting as if they are that evil power attempting to crush us. It's a truly frightening time in history for large segments of our population. Basically, any minority group that we could name has felt some fear, insecurity, and even endured some verbal and physical attacks. Like the Jews trying to navigate on a certain lives following the collapse of Jerusalem in AD 70, people in the U.S. are struggling to know how to move forward into an uncertain future. It's like the path for our own life's journey is suddenly lined with scary things, like the haunted woods and the Wizard of Oz. Very real danger is lurking for many people. But Jesus flipped the script in this week's narrative. He warned people they'd be harassed, persecuted, and arrested, but he said the arrest would be an opportunity to testify. An opportunity. That completely changes things. Instead of arrests being completely horrible, which I'm sure they are, we're given a piece of hope. Being arrested means a chance to speak your truth, to give your message, to testify. During the civil rights movement of the 60s, activists used their arrests as tools to further awareness of discrimination. Today, in North Dakota, water protectors are using the violent attempts at silencing them as a catalyst to draw attention to their efforts to stop construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Black Lives Matter has taught us to use the video recorders of our cell phones to document injustice. People in frightening circumstances around the country are turning to social media and live streaming to create allies and hopefully to limit the harm done by their aggressors. Those who turn to violence are beginning to discover it's no longer one person's word against another. It's now documented on video. Smearing the reputation of the person being attacked won't work anymore to get them off the hook. Imagine if Trayvon Martin had filmed his encounter with George Zimmerman. The outcome may have been very different. Being an activist is not easy. Standing up against forces of power that are attempting to do harm is not easy. But it isn't anything new either. Our scriptures give us stories of brave people who've taken a stand in spite of the risk to themselves. One of my favorite is the story of Esther. She had hit the jackpot. She went from being a marginalized, orphan, Jewish teen girl living with her uncle to being queen with luxury all around her. She was passing as a citizen of that country instead of living her truth as a Jew, but being able to pass had elevated her to an unimaginable level of security and privilege compared to the life she had known. Then evil reared its ugly head. A man named Haman hated Jews so much that he wanted them all dead. 
Haman was a convincing guy and got the king to sign an order which would exterminate all Jews on a certain date in the very near future. Esther could have kept silent. She could have breathed a sigh of relief that her true identity was hidden and continued to enjoy her life of luxury. But her uncle Mordecai prodded her conscience and empowered her. He told her it was her choice to act or not act, but that she may have come to her position of power and privilege for just such a time as this. The time when she could summon all her courage and save her people. Now even approaching the king without an invitation was a risky thing. That boldness could have resulted in Esther's immediate execution, but she decided to take the chance. She fasted and prayed, then armed with a plan, she stepped out in courage. In the end, it was Haman who lost his life, and the Jews were saved because one woman, with an uncle encouraging her, took a stand. We have lots of examples of people who've shown us great bravery. We're recognizing our veterans today. Certainly it is a brave thing to put on a military uniform even during peacetime. There is no way of knowing what will be demanded of you, only that you must answer whatever that call may be. Being brave enough to serve doesn't mean fear is eliminated. It only means that fear doesn't have the final word. The New American Standard Bible includes the phrases, do not fear, 57 times, and do not be afraid, 46 times. I'm pretty sure the phrases wouldn't appear so many times if we weren't going to be asked to face our fears lots of times in our lives. It's a scary time in the world right now. There are lots of monsters dressed in human costumes. Dangers are real. Individually, the fear can be overwhelming. But standing together, united as people committed to love one another, we can take action to bring light even to even the darkest of places. Friends, if we were ever called to live out our open and affirming covenant, that time is now. We are needed to be a safety pin, holding each other together as we continue to share God's love with all people. We need to use our voices, our presence, our bodies, to protect those who are being subjected to hatred and danger. And we need to do that by being loved, not by becoming aggressors ourselves. Only love can bring the healing that's needed. We can't put the fire of hatred out by throwing hatred back. More hate only heals the flames of division and danger. We must be love. We must be light. The safety pin is a new symbol of being a safe ally for someone encountering discrimination. It's a promise to hold that person in our own circle of safety. It says we will stand, sit, walk, listen, whatever is needed to help that person feel safe. It does not mean we will attack the bully. It does not mean we will use our words to keep anger upon the aggressor. It means we will do what we can help the person feeling unsafe to get out of that situation. It is a good thing for us to do, but it is not enough. We also need to work to bring change. We need to engage our government, demanding that our elected officials no longer tolerate the oppressive actions of their supporters. We need to demand that our government truly represents all people, not just wealthy white people and big corporations that somehow have been given the rights of humans, although they're only an entity on a sheet of paper. We need to be actively involved in our communities and in all levels of government so that we truly are representative, with all voices being heard and all people being honored as valuable. Thursday evening, a group of people from the community gathered here to process their grief and fear and anger surrounding the election and the hate that is being spewed. We needed a space to process the events that have been happening. We needed community. As an action plan from that time together, we've dedicated ourselves to building connections across dividing lines. So sometime before the end of the year, there will be at least one community gathering in Albion specifically designed to help build real community, to 
strengthen the bonds of friendship that already exist and to create new connections. This is an important work. We can't continue to be us and them. We need to work past the concept of other. We need to live the words we speak each week, loving God, loving self, and loving neighbor. It's not always easy. It can be frightening, but together we can do this. We can bring healing to people who have been marginalized and who are being threatened. In our council meeting today, I'll suggest that we have joint worship services with other churches, especially churches of color. We could take turns closing one building and have both congregations gather in the other building. Just swapping pastors, a pulpit swap, isn't enough. It lets us stay our own little unit without forcing us to get to know each other. There's much work to be done to heal our nation. We, as people of love, need to be the leaders in that work. Let us draw courage from our stories, the sacred ones in our scriptures, and the sacred ones written by the lives of those who have dared to stand for what is right. Let us rededicate ourselves to our commitment to love, and let us become activists, sharing that role far and wide. Because who knows? We may have been born for just such a time as this. You will have noticed this handout with your bulletin. Please read it. It's small print, it's long, it's important. It explains how to be an advocate for someone who's being harassed, how to defuse it and not end up with things getting worse and uglier. It explains some of the risks. Um, I'm wearing my safety pin. I'm wearing it now because my grandchildren are not with me. After having read these, I won't be wearing it when the boys are with me because it is not fair for me to put them in a situation that they may become part of ugliness around or the object of someone's anger. Think about your own ability to wear it, your own decision whether to wear it, when you'll wear it, whether you'll even wear it at all. But remember that it's a way now that's being used to let people know you're a safe person if they need someone. Um, and that may mean that you just stand beside them. Um, while we're taking offering, I'll ask a couple people to also take dishes of safety pins and pass them around. You don't have to decide now whether you'll wear one or not. If you want to take one, take one. And then think about whether or not it's right for you. Um, if you want to take a couple of them so you can put them on a couple different jackets and not have to forget that you are wearing a different coat and you still want to have a pin on, feel free to do that. Um, it's a political statement, but it's also a religious statement. <laughs>